Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up, it is Motivation Monday here on the Exam Room, and Amber Lee Childs is here to share her incredible journey back to health with us. Ten years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and today she is teaching others how to fight back. And that is a fight that starts with the food that is on your plate. Amber Lee is here with us to educate us as our Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign rolls on. Amber Lee, thanks for taking the time. Looking forward to speaking with you. And also with us today, kicking off a new week, is Dr. Neil Barnard. He and I are going to be taking a look at a big weekend in the world of vegan athletics as a major record was toppled by the world's fastest vegan and man oh man are we excited about this one so dr barnard will join us to celebrate and take a look at how a plant-based diet can in fact make you faster make your recovery faster and your performance even better dr barnard what a weekend this has been huh it sure has been chuck look forward to talking about it and we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So send in your question for Dr. Barnard. Anything health and nutrition related is fair game. Just to go ahead and drop that in the comment box or tweet it to us using the hashtag exam room live. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Monday, October 26th, 2020. And we begin the week with an unwanted update on the coronavirus, both Friday and Saturday, setting new records for new cases as more than 225,000 infections were reported reported over the weekend. The national average, now nearly 70,000 cases a day. That's a 20% increase over last week. The death toll also on the rise. The average now at roughly 800 per day, a spike of more than 11%. And health officials say that number is likely to rise with hospitals in some parts of the country already at capacity. In other news, the rate of breast cancer among Indian and Pakistani American women is lower than other ethnicities, but the cases that there are tend to come at a younger age and at a more advanced stage. A study published in the International Journal of Cancer indicates that there are a number of reasons why early detection often doesn't occur, including a lack of family support, a cultural belief that the disease is punishment for past deeds and language barriers. Women of South Asian descent represent the fastest growing demographic graphic for new breast cancer cases in the U.S. And finally, we recently reported on a push in the UK to curb childhood obesity by outlawing junk food ads on TV. But a new study is showing that advertisers are already finding new ways to reach kids. They're spending billions to showcase their high fat and sugary products on YouTube. The report by health researchers at NYU finds companies are spending more money to advertise online, some nearly $2 billion every year. The research also finds nearly 90% of all food and drink that is advertised on YouTube is unhealthy, while just 3% are for foods such as fruit. YouTube, by the way, is the second most visited website in the world. All right, let's go on a healthier track here, shall we? And change gears here and shift over to an amazing feat that was accomplished over the weekend where the world's fastest vegan broke a record that many thought would never fall. Congratulations indeed to Formula One superstar Lewis Hamilton, who raced past the competition at the Portuguese Grand Prix on Sunday to claim the 92nd victory of his illustrious career, making him the winningest driver in the storied history of the world's premier racing league. And Lewis Hamilton's fuel of choice? Well, it's plants, of course. He is 100% vegan. Quite the accomplishment. And Dr. Barnard, I know just sharing some emails with you yesterday and based on previous conversations, you are an enormous Lewis Hamilton fan. So, I mean, what a day. What a day that was. Well, Lewis Hamilton has been very outspoken about his diet. He's been a vegan and he's he's not only a, a vegan for health to get the health edge, but he has a real heart for animals and for the environment. And I remember when he first joined uh, Formula One, um, he was just a phenomenon to be, to be reckoned with and has risen through the ranks. 
And this year he'll be winning his, uh, almost certainly, uh, winning this his seventh world championship. And yesterday uh, he became the winningest race driver ever. And uh, it's by by winning now 92, 92 Formula One races. Um, uh, previously, a couple of weeks ago, he equaled Michael Schumacher at 91 and now he's at 92 and he just hasn't shown any signs of stopping. And, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see a person with such skill, such maturity, um, such raw talent, but also with such heart. And he really speaks out and encourages other people to do a vegan diet too. Um, if you don't mind Chuck, phenomenal. It, it, okay for me, you, let me just back up a little bit. I'd like to talk about athletics and, and sport. Uh, you and I have talked about this a whole lot, um, Chuck, but if you don't, don't mind, I'm gonna share some, some uh, images. Go right ahead. Um, okay. Uh, I want to give the credit really to Carl Lewis for, for really bringing vegan diets into the mainstream in the world of athletics. Uh, Carl Lewis has won nine, he won nine Olympic golds. Um, and he still, he still holds the record now um, for indoor long jump, which he set in 1984. And Carl Lewis has been vegan and very outspokenly so, uh, very strong, very um, quick. Uh, he, a sprinter, long jumper, just incredible. And then Scott Jurek, I think, has also shown that uh, as a tremendous, just top, top, top level, ultra distance um, athlete, Scott Jurek showed that it's not just for sprinting, it's not just for long jumping, but if you want to be in it for the long haul, uh, Scott will run these 100 mile races, 150 mile races. I'm talking about one stint running all that way, and he holds the world's record now for running the entire Appalachian Trail. Uh, Rich Roll, many people know Rich Roll from his podcast, and Rich Roll is just a top-level athlete as well. All of them are powered by a vegan diet. And then when it came, it came not just endurance and speed, but also power, it really started with tennis. Serena Williams went vegan because she had an autoimmune condition, Sjogren's disease and got the dairy and meat and everything out of her diet to, so that she could get her performance back, and she did. And then on the male side of the tennis court, Novak Djokovic has been vegan for a long time, and, and he then actually opened a vegan restaurant as well, and has just uh, been uh, on top or near the top for year after year after year after year. And then going from speed, uh, reaction time, power, to then people who need serious muscle. Um, I'm gonna credit Derek Morgan from the Tennessee Titans for waking up the world of football to vegan diet. In football, you need to be big. You don't really wanna be flabby though. The more of you that's muscle and lean, the better off you're gonna be. And, and Charity Morgan, who I, I know you know, uh, you've sp spoken with both uh, Derek Morgan and Charity Morgan, uh, was cooking vegan meals for Derek and then she found herself cooking for 15 or 16 of the other Titans. And the Tennessee Titans really just, I gotta tell you, they just really took off. And I don't think the food could get all the credit for it, but it gets some of it for sure. Um, and then uh, the world's strongest man, Patrick Baboumian, uh, demonstrated that on a vegan diet, you could lift more than you could any other way. And then it started going into the world of cognition. Uh, Jonas von Essen, was the world's memory champ uh, a couple of times. And this is where you memorize a pack of cards in 30 seconds um, and do these incredible memory feats. And Jonas von Essen uh, was powered by a completely vegan diet. And uh, in the smart person category, let me throw in uh, Albert Einstein, who actually wrote many, many decades ago, it's my view that the vegetarian manner of living by its purely physical effect on the human temperament would most beneficially influence a lot of mankind. And uh, Einstein wrote, so I am living without fats, without meat, without fish, but I'm feeling quite well this way. It always seems to me that man was not born to be a carnivore. And Chuck, look what it did for him. So if you want to excel in whether it's uh, physical sports or whatever, uh, you can do really well. And uh, last year we published in the journal Nutrients um, all the reasons why a plant-based diet is really uh, a good a good way to go, the best way to go for endurance sports. Okay, so that was kind of the end of the story. Now, the vegan edge though, you get better endurance, better leanness um, so that you're more muscle, not fat. It reduces inflammation. 
it speeds your recovery. So those aching muscles and aching joints are able to get back in gear faster. Uh, you avoid the coach syndrome. This is where the basketball player who's been lean because he's burning four or 5,000 calories a day is now a coach and is still eating lots of stuff, but now gaining weight. Uh, if you're eating a healthy vegan diet, you, you are lean and you stay lean. Um, but then over the weekend, what we saw was the concentration effect. What I mean is Lewis Hamilton is driving a car. You're up to 200 miles an hour or faster. You've got twists and turns and the person who wins is the person with a good car, the right tires and everything else, but a person who can maintain concentration at that, those speeds for a couple of hours without flagging. And Lewis Hamilton has been just the best of the field. So, um, the reason I wanted to raise the concentration issue is in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. A couple of months ago, researchers published results on diet and concentration and reaction time. They were at Ohio State University. Here's what they did. Um, they did a test called the Continuous Performance Test, which was originally developed for uh, diagnosing hyperactive kids, um, kids who, who can't stay focused. And it was invented by Keith Connors, who used to work here at Children's Hospital in, in, uh, here in Washington and is now used all, all over the place, but not just in kids, but in adults, because it shows, can you maintain your concentration? What's your reaction time? For example, let's say on the, I ask you, every time you see the letter A on your screen, press your space bar. And so you see the letter A, R, T, A, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, you can hit the space bar at the right time, at the wrong time, you can be slow. And it's really become the way to test reaction time. That's the continuous performance test. Mm -hmm. However, it depends on what you had for breakfast. And if you ate a lot of saturated fat, that's the fat in dairy and in meat, it slows down your reaction time. It interferes with your concentration. So to have really good solid reaction time and to be a good racer, um, you, you don't just need to be strong. You don't, you don't just have to, to muscle that wheel around because it's a very, very physically demanding sport, but you also have to be quick and stay quick. And let's say you and I aren't in the Grand Prix of Portugal um, racing that way, but you want to stay awake in the afternoon have good concentration, have your wits about you. Um, you wanna eat the right breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That means a plant-based diet. Uh, fruits and grains and vegetables and legumes have almost none of this bad saturated fat in them, but cheese, meat, chicken, fish have substantial amounts of them. And that's why we're getting away from it. The last thing I just wanna mention, Chuck, is that in the world of Formula One, uh, individuals really have to also do one other kind of athletic uh, uh, thing, if I could put it that way. Um, they raced yesterday in Portugal. Next week, they race, they're racing in Mexico. They race in Russia. They race in, the, race in the Middle East. And one of the most demanding things for these drivers is just jet lag and getting on a plane and getting off and trying to race at different altitudes and different time zones. And the person whose diet keeps their cognition intact, that's the person who's going to be the champion. And that's Lewis Hamilton. Back to you, Chuck. Absolutely. Uh, and I would I would also take it a step further. And I think that a person who may not be a racing fan may think, well, OK, but how physically fit do they have to be? They're just sitting in the car for a few hours. But if you actually take the time to watch a race, you will see just how demanding this can be physically. You know, over the years watching these races, I've seen drivers actually have to be pulled from the car because they're so spent mentally, physically. They're just so exhausted because of that level of concentration and the physical exertion that it takes to maintain control of that vehicle for so long, it really does encompass all of those properties you were just talking about when it comes to a plant-based diet. Um, it, it really does. So start from the head to the feet, um, starting with the head, their necks are about as, as wide as a linebacker um, because their head is getting slammed this way, that way, the other way. It's got a, a helmet on it and they're going literally a couple hundred miles an hour. Couple, uh, and then they uh, have to turn very acutely to the left, to the right. They break on a dime. Um, then their arms, they have to keep the, obviously the steering, uh, together and then their feet, they've got to obviously ham hit the brakes, hit the, the gas and so forth. In fact, late in yesterday's race, um, I was listening to Lewis's radio and he said, Oh, I got a cramp. <laughs> and they said, hang on Lewis. 
the very next lap, he, he, he hit the fastest lap of the race. And so I thought that is a guy who maintains his performance no matter what. So, Absolutely. Special guy. All right. So we wish uh, Lewis Hamilton the best in now his quest for a seventh championship. Uh, but Dr. Barnard, let's switch gears here. And uh, it is uh, Motivation Monday coming up. We've got the story of Amber Lee Childs in just a moment. But before we get to that, let's first get to the doctor's mailbag. And we have a question coming to us from Andrea, who wants to know a little bit uh, more about children and nutrition. She was looking at health headlines. She saw the story about advertising on YouTube for junk food. She wants to know, Dr. Barnard, what are the main nutrients to focus on for small children who are growing up vegan? Well, first of all, thank you for asking that question. Um, if that means that you have kids at home and you're raising them on a healthy vegan diet, that's fantastic because it's a, a real benefit that most kids don't have the advantage of. For, for many kids, they grow up on bacon and sausage and chicken and milkshakes and they think that's healthy food and then they have to at some point unlearn all of that stuff when their doctor's trying to help them to lose weight or get their cholesterol down so so you're you're starting off great okay um the big nutrients you hear about protein and carbohydrate and fat um the first thing to say is if you have the four food groups as your child's main diet that's vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans protein is really a non-issue because those foods have proteins and that combination will give it to you. Um, when it comes to fat, the, your child needs fat, but don't let anybody tell you that the brain needs saturated fat. That's the bad fat, that's the anti-cognition fat. That's the main fat in dairy. But plants tend to be um, high in the unsaturated fats that the brain actually needs. Um, healthy carbohydrates, though they're in root vegetables and grains and beans, and they give your body the glucose that it needs for power. So that's the main stuff. Um, it is essential to supplement with vitamin B12. It's in every child's multiple vitamin, like Flintstones vitamins or any other. Don't miss it. That's critical. Um, there, there is, of course, iron and calcium. These are minerals. And the old fashioned approach was meat for iron, uh, milk for calcium, but they actually both come in green leafy vegetables. There's also some in beans and those are much healthier sources because they don't have the cholesterol and junk with them. So off you go. Your child is lucky to have you for a mom. All right, Dr. Barnard, thank you very much, my friend. Sure. Thank you, Chuck. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. As always, we will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So keep on posting it in the chat box or in the comment section. And you can also tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. Just send it on over to at PCRM or at Chuck Carroll WLC. All right. It is, in fact, Motivation Monday here on the Exam Room Live as our Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign rolls right along for the month of October. And today we are spotlighting a woman who was working as a breast health educator and then found herself diagnosed with breast cancer, the very disease that she had been teaching others about. Now, 10 years in remission, she is still teaching, but her message is one that she says had been muted in the past. She's now teaching others about the powerful role that diet can play in breast cancer prevention and how the best chance to lower your risk, yes, you, is by looking at what's on your plate. With that, we welcome Amber Lee Childs to the exam room live. Amber Lee, thanks so very much for being here today. Thanks, Chuck, for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm thrilled that you are here as well because you have such a, a powerful story. So can you walk us through that? Yeah, so I have lost a lot of family members to cancer. Started my dad when I was 16, he passed away. My grandfather when I was in college. Um, my grandmother had had cervical cancer. So it just seemed like everybody had had some form of cancer and I became a, an advocate early on, if you will. Um, and so with that, I be started working with breast cancer nonprofits, educating the community about the importance of breast health. But most of that was about getting screened, getting mammograms. You know, we'd say be healthy, eat a healthy diet. Um, but it was really focused on screening and exercise. And fast forward, um, I founded a nonprofit that specifically focused on education, and that was in Florida. And then I relocated to Wisconsin. And when I got to Wisconsin, I really was looking for my roots. And so what do you do? You do the things that you're comfortable with, that you're passionate about. And so um, volunteering nonprofit was part of that. And I started volunteering with a, a national breast cancer organization. And uh, with that, I was helping raise money for funds that would pay for mammograms. 
Um, it was about four months later, I became symptomatic. I had a burning sensation in my breast. I had an undefined lump, just had pain that would wake me up in the middle of the night. It was like my body was talking to me saying, something is wrong, Amberly. you need to listen. And so I went to the organization I was helping. I said, hey, I need to get one of those free mammograms. How does that happen? So fast forward, public assistance helped and the nonprofit helped pay for the mammogram that diagnosed me with stage 3C breast cancer. The way I like to think of it is I was on the fence, right? I had one foot in the, the four camp. I had one foot in the stage three camp and it was very aggressive. It was very advanced and I was only 36 years old. Um, luckily, I have been educated on the concept of food as medicine and it was something I was very interested in. And simultaneously, I had registered to go back to school to become a dietitian who wanted to specialize in oncology. And a month before school started, I had to drop out because I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So when I was diagnosed and the treatment I sought out, um, after eight oncologist interviews, number eight was the only one who said to me, what you eat matters, and we are going to put you on a strict vegan diet. We are going to exercise. We're going to treat your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit. The first seven oncologists were like, I don't care what you eat. And that was very alarming to me that I was going to need such a serious, intense chemotherapy regimen, but yet I could eat donuts in their opinion and be totally okay. And I knew my body needed more. And so there I, I sought out integrative oncology. And I worked with this amazing team of professionals that taught me about food. I knew a little bit, but I had so much to learn. And when I met the folks at Block Medical Center, it was like my heart felt happy because I felt like I wasn't just going to be in a treatment facility with everyone else, just lining up, getting your chemo, getting your medication, getting your lumpectomy, your mastectomy, and sending you onward. I was working with a team who was teaching me cooking classes. I would get to eat the food that they would prepare for me. I would go to Reiki. I would go to a massage. I would get, I was all the while, I'm getting my infusion. And so when I left this integrative experience, I was so inspired that food had such a big piece of my healing. And it was really instilled in me that if food was part of the problem, food could also be part of the solution. I'm healthy now, it's 10 years, that, it's 10 years later today, but in 2014, I joined the um, Food for Life instructor team with the Physicians Committee. And when I found the, the Food for Life team, when I found PCRM, it was like, I found my tribe, I found my people. There were people who believed in the same things that I did. And it wasn't like, I mean, sometimes from day to day, I feel like I'm, I'm swimming upstream when you live a vegan lifestyle because some people don't understand. But for me, I always lead with health first. And by leading with health, my goal is that I can save my body, I can save myself, I can help my family. I'm also raising, I have a 19 month old, I'm raising her on a vegan diet. Um, my husband is an athlete and I wanna be able to use food to stay here. And I've been able to do that. And it gets me really excited to share that information in the community because when I was in treatment, no one was talking about this. It was such mm -hmm. a foreign concept. Mm -hmm. And I really want people to know, like, ask that second opinion, ask the third opinion. If you have to go to the eighth oncologist, do it. Because there are doctors, clinicians, nurse practitioners, dietitians, community health advocates like myself who really believe that you can take back the power and you can really start to change things by what you put on your fork. Yeah, I've heard that uh, from so many survivors now doing this show is is that nutrition is paramount when it comes to treatment and it can really make all the difference in the world as you're going through chemotherapy, as you're going through all of those those rounds of treatment. Um, and and they would just compare how they felt so many times compared to others who were, as you say, eating the donuts. And another person had told me that um, the nurses very kindly would bring in hamburgers for everyone to eat during treatment, you know, just so they had a little bit of nourishment in their belly if they wanted it and just how different that the the plant-based person felt compared to those who were still eating that standard american diet 
and and the difference that that made. But I want to go back, uh, Amberly, to when you were diagnosed. You say that you had such a strong family history of cancer. When you received that diagnosis, was that something that you you almost felt like the bomb had been exploded and it had just been ticking inside of you for years, and you were just waiting for that day to come? Yes and no. Because of the family history, I definitely felt like, hey, my number's gonna get pulled here eventually. I need to be knowledgeable. I need to be find things quickly, which means, you know, are you getting regular screenings? Are you doing self exams? Do you know your body? And that's something I'm a huge proponent for is between going to your doctor visits, you need to know this body. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Women need to look at their bodies unclothed. And that's something that we really have a difficult time doing, but just visually looking at your body can really tell us, male or female, there's a lump, something's wrong. I see, I see a, an imperfection, something that hasn't been here. So I did feel like my number had been pulled, but the other side of me is like, wait a minute, I'm 36 years old. I'm engaged to be married. I've never had children. Wait, hold on, I'm gonna have to do what? Um, and that entitled a lot of surgeries. I've had eight different surgeries to my chest and abdomen. Um, I've lost my fertility to my breast cancer treatments. Uh, and so there's been a lot of, when you're diagnosed at a young age, it is like the bomb is dropped because you have a lot more challenges as a young survivor than say somebody who might be diagnosed at 75. That person's had a family, they've lived maybe, well, a good life hopefully, but they've lived longer and so, I remember my husband and I going on lockdown, as we call it, and we just kind of got the bad news. It was right over uh, Fourth of July holiday, and we just locked ourselves inside for like two days. We cried it out, we screamed it out. I was pissed. I did a couple workouts, and I tried to get some of that anger out so I could approach what was going to be the hardest thing of my life with a clear-headed mind um, and focus on building a team of practitioners and clinicians that wanted to be on my team. Like I felt like mm -hmm. anyone could give me chemo, anyone could do surgery for me, but who wanted to do my surgery? Who wanted to be on my medical team? And that's something that I think that anyone, whether you have knee surgery, whether you're having gallbladder surgery, whatever, you need to build the A team, the team of people who are gonna show up for you when you're under, when you're scared, and they're gonna bring their best. And that sometimes takes a little bit of time to find. A couple, couple more questions here. Um, I guess my first one is, how different do you think your outcome would have been given the, your diagnosis, the aggressive form of the cancer, given your familial history uh, with the disease and uh, what you know now uh, about the power of nutrition, the role that food can play here in that holistic lifestyle that you were describing? How different do you think your outcome would have been had you stayed on that standard American diet on that course? Yeah, it's it's really scary to think about that, Chuck, because I was living the standard American life, eating the diet, doing what I did. And um, I think it could have been very different because I, I, I'm a cycling instructor, I teach spin classes, but I was like smoking cigarettes on the way to teach a spin class. And when that would end, I would go to the nearest fast food restaurant and I would eat chicken and cheese quesadillas on top of a salad and think I was doing good with a cheese dip and nachos and margaritas. And my, my now husband and I would go home and be like, hmm, we nailed it today. We got our workout in and we were able to smoke cigarettes. And so I think where I, as an educator, like to try and talk to folks is, if you, we, we, we kind of trick ourselves, right? Like in my mind, I was like, well, if I can smoke cigarettes and still teach a spin class, then I'm okay, right? And so that's the problem is most people don't see the sickness that's happening inside of them because cancer doesn't develop overnight. Heart disease doesn't develop overnight. And so if we can't see it or feel it immediately, we then think it's not happening. And so if I know, if I had continued smoking, drinking, eating garbage and doing all that, I can't even imagine how my body could have ever gotten to a calm place where it could have fought the disease that all of that lifestyle helped me earn. Wow, that is such a really good point. That is such, I mean, just an incredible point that you just made. I think that we should bottle that, uh, <laughs> try to sell it, at the very least put it on a poster or a bumper sticker. That is phenomenal. Um, final question for you, Amberly, is this. 
you overcame so much, so many surgeries, so many rounds of treatment, you know, the, the mental anguish that comes with it. And here you are today, 10 years later in remission, a survivor and educator. What does the word survivor mean to you? It's a day to day thing. I wake up after so many surgeries. There are some days I have so much pain. I have scar tissue. I have, I mean, I always say underneath these clothes, it's like an Edward Scissorhands show, you know, but we, we put it together, we come out and we do our thing. But I think things would have been very, very different for me. And yeah, there's, I've gone through so many different things that They've helped create the strength in me, but I think really it's it's day to day. We have to survive and you get through today and you look forward to tomorrow. And I'm so blessed that I have a wonderful husband. I have a wonderful family that supports me and has allowed me to take a career change and quit my nonprofit job that I had. And now I run my own business. I run a vegan plant-based business. Um, I sell soup to the community. And a lot of those people that, that I make fresh homemade plant-based food for are people who I met teaching the cancer classes or a diabetes class or teaching the kickstart class. And so I meet people in the community who are surviving like me every day and they're looking for those extra tools to help give them a little bit of the edge. Like how can I get a little bit more, even though my, I'm maybe five years out from my cancer diagnosis or 10 years out, how do I do a little bit more? And food is the answer. Keep breathing, keep exercising, doing all those great things, but we gotta change what we put on our fork and we gotta eat more power plate foods. Fruits, vegetables, yeah, and, grains, beans, nuts, legumes. One hundred percent, and uh, all good things that you put into your soup. And I know that you, as you mentioned, uh, close to the top of the interview, you're also a food for life instructor. So you're teaching classes. I know your website, plantjoy.net. But I want to know about these soups. If somebody is interested in getting <laughs> their hands on the Amber Lee special soup, where can they go to get in touch with you and and get their hands on this deliciousness? Yeah, so we deliver throughout the Milwaukee area. Um, we deliver once a week. We deliver every day on Monday. So I'm going to hit the road as soon as I get out of here. Uh, but it's plantjoy.net. You can order there. You can see the soups that I have available. And I tell you, what I strive to do, I mean, I'm raised in the South. I'm a Southerner. So, you know, everything I grew up on was fried and fried again. And so what <laughs> I try to do is take foods that we love, recreate them in a vegan, plant based fashion, and then have people eating food they love because food is, is is familial. We eat because it makes us, it reminds us of our family. When I make my chicken and dumplings, it reminds me of my grandmother because she taught me how to make that. So I don't need to get rid of the chicken and dumplings, but can I maybe make it gluten-free? Can I maybe not use white flour? Can I do this in a healthier version? So that's what I strive to do with my soups um, is get some really good healthy food into people's bellies. And maybe some folks, especially now with COVID, who don't feel as comfortable going to the store regularly. Also, I deliver it to you. So check me out, plantjoy.net. There you go, Milwaukee. You are on a mission today, plantjoy.net. <laughs> and uh, thank you so very much, Amberly. What an incredible story. Congratulations on your success and this new business. And I just, I could not be happier for you um, for so many very reasons. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, Chuck, for having me. All right. All throughout the month of October, we are indeed joining together in the fight against breast cancer for our Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign. And we would love it if you would stand beside us with Dr. Barnard, myself, Amber Lee. And all you need to do is head over to letsbeatbreastcancer.org. And there you will find the very four steps that we have identified that can help you lower your risk of breast cancer. You can pledge to follow those steps, learn about them, and then say, yes, I will follow these steps and lower my risk of breast cancer. So I won't become one of the eight women who will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime going to give myself the best chance not to be that statistic. So learn those steps, pledge to follow them. And when you do, you can also be entered to win a great grand prize pack valued at up to $600 from our Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign sir, sponsors such as Rancho Gordo Beans. So I want to say thank you to them for supporting the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign this year as well. And you see some of the great grand prizes that are on the screen right there right now. So head over to letsbeatbreastcancer.org. Follow those steps, get registered to win. And 
just for giggles, you will also receive a free e-cookbook filled with cancer fighting recipes. Also be sure to subscribe to the exam room podcast by the physicians committee. Dr. Christy Funk and I all month long have been on there sharing some great breast cancer fighting tips. Matter of fact, the last show that I did with her a few episodes back, it listed off the best fruit to fight breast cancer, the best vegetable to fight breast cancer, seed, legumes, spice, all of those great things to fight breast cancer. You can find that if you head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever it is that you get your favorite shows from, hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating as well. Join us as we help make the world a healthier place and beat breast cancer. All right. That is all the time that we have on today's show. I want to say thank you once again to Amber Lee for joining us and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you guys so much for your time. And I want to say thank you to you, my exam roomie, for spending a little time with us to get your weekend off or your, your week. I wish it was Friday already. Your week off on a healthy foot. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. But until then, stay safe take a stand, and keep it plant-based.